Can smart electronics save the science demonstration? Peter Colin Hill Glenbrook Advanced Concept Institute 9 Glenbrook Road, Glenbrook, NSW, Australia Introduction Could we learn from the techniques scientists used to weed out misconceptions from their publications and get them to lift the standard of classroom teaching? Could smart electronics provide a key tactic in the battle to rein in the scores of zombie concepts that stalk our schools? We believe that the answer to both these questions is yes. While working out the details, the strategy, the electronics, and the quantum physics, it is important not to lose sight of the dire position education now finds itself in and thus not be sensible of the need for some sort of immediate action. Substandard science has a toxic effect similar to termite bait. The bait is softer than wood making it an easy meal for the termites. This is unfortunate as the poison weakens their jaws. They can no longer eat wood as it is now too hard for them. Once hooked, they can only eat more bait. Similarly, the use of poor quality easy to chew explanations conditions the teachers so that once they have absorbed them, they struggle to digest anything more complex in future. The whole termite colony is on borrowed time as the weakened workers return to the nest, die, are cannibalized spreading the toxin, and so soften the jaws of all. At no point are the termites able to work out what is happening and avert their certain doom. We explore some science demonstrations that are operated by inexpensive Arduino-based smart electronics. This enables them to respond to students and also connect itself to the internet. This is a small step in the direction of social robots. To capture the spirit of the concept, we have come up with a brand identity of scientist in the box. The hope is if you can orchestrate how the demonstration operates then you can reduce the risk of inexpert explanations and increase the level of student engagement. In this paper we first frame the problem and its solution. The problem is there is insufficient expertise needed to accurately teach science and the solution is to hardwire in the deficit using smart electronics. The second section considers the significance of this solution. Does it solve an immediate issue? Does it address the underlying problem? Is it affordable? The third section covers how the scientist in the box might perform in the classroom. Having covered the problem, then the feasibility of a solution, then the expanded role of smart electronics we reach the fourth section in which we report the specifics of three prototypes. Besides showing activity of a duck dancing to Doctor Who music, a utility box of sensors, and a pendulum swung by invisible quantum mechanical forces the progress toward having an expert clearly explaining what is going on can be assessed. What's the problem? How likely is it that by the year 2040 science teachers are going to have a repertoire of these lessons housed in plastic boxes? To find out we have built and road tested three prototypes for selected scenarios that we reason might well unfold not in today's classrooms but that of 2040. As a reasonable objective we've assumed that future students will be more fluent in quantum mechanics than those walking around today's schools. Whether we are developing a new teaching process or planning a novel cake for a restaurant some of the considerations remain the same. What ingredients do we need? What do people currently consume? Customers have expectations, but what is the history that has transpired thus far, and what is it that people can be thinking that makes these particular expectations so important to them? How can we craft this new solution to be the natural successor of what has gone before? If you contrast today's world with life in the age of the pharaohs, it is not hard to notice some dramatic differences. Today we take for granted aeroplanes, hospitals and weather forecasting. These are just some of the areas for consideration, but you could think of many others. Almost any modern endeavor that you care to imagine depends upon the expertise of highly skilled professionals, pilots, doctors, and meteorologists to name but a few. They are not born with these specialist skills, but acquire their capabilities later on in their lives by undertaking years of training. However, they first must get a general education so they can process and assimilate this training. This in turn means they need to have encountered the essential education trifecta namely, skilled teachers using the right tools applying them to the relevant content. In this paper we consider the proposition that smart demonstrations, think being hooked up to a smartphone's components, can enhance the odds of this trifecta. Will smart electronics transform demonstrations into tools that can competently deliver their content, even in the hands of less expert teachers? Is it hype, or do the three prototypes we present here together suggest a credible path forward? There are many things that you would have taught the 1920s pilots, doctors and meteorologists that could well be still applicable now. Whilst this may be true there are some skills that were crucial in the 1920s that although quite interesting no longer remain so relevant today. For example, how do you exit a cockpit in mid-flight and walk out on the wing to fix a spluttering engine, how do you amputate infected limbs, or what can you tell from cloud shapes? 
Asking why this should be the case, we find that a lot of the intervening progress stems from our ability to use computers that interpret the flow of information streaming in from electronic sensors. Perhaps, it could be argued that the teaching profession is somehow fundamentally a different endeavor. Perhaps smart technology will have a role more at the margins, but the core flow of information into a student's head will remain the same. Perhaps the best we can hope for are the age-old textbook explanations that seem obvious and concise at the cost of letting through a few seemingly harmless misconceptions. Maybe we are locked into explanations that are throttled by the teacher's limited understanding? Perhaps. In this paper we propose a teacher bypass. We consider hitting the pause button on stream of consciousness simplifications. With smart electronics running things the demonstrations figuratively speaking can work out when best to press their own play button and channel expert explanations directly to the students. We aim for an educational interaction that develops concepts that have been expertly simplified. The students still pass the next test, but care is taken to avoid inadvertently transmitting misconceptions. In computer parlance students don't download into their minds virus explanations that will eventually cause their cognitive operating system to crash. Passing comment on this malady Einstein said, simplify as much as possible but not further. The question of feasibility. If you had a brilliant aeronautical or medical breakthrough, perhaps you would be ill-advised to burst into a busy cockpit or operating theatre and argue your case. You would be told it is just not possible for us to drop what we are doing and put your idea into practice. Classroom teaching can be pictured as a cockpit crew fully engaged in navigating knowledge space or some kind of cognitive operating theatre. In all these scenarios you are watching experts following a script and enacting well-rehearsed procedures. You would be well advised that having understood the prospective benefits of your breakthrough to pause and observe experts at their work. What is the language and thinking that they use? What is actually happening? To conceptualize what is going on in education you could imagine it as a massive airport where none of the planes actually take off. Students are greeted as they board the aircraft, they are drilled in emergency procedures, the plane taxes for a while and then returns to the terminal. There are brochures about the holiday resort at Quantum Mechanics. The reality of this destination is empty streets with tumbleweeds blowing through. There have been no arrivals for quite some time now. You will find if you look deeply into education there is no one in charge. This is also true of science, but of this fact, scientists are acutely aware. Experiments are designed to reveal the goings on of nature. Scientific candor, peer review and an open source culture are just some of the self-regulating behaviors that welcome all to understand and all to question. It is not surprising to a scientist that you would produce a prototype to put your ideas to the test. If not one, then more could well be necessary. In science you make your case to nature for all to see. In education the good and the bad ideas sing out at the same time competing with each other for attention. This generates a lot of background noise. Using the airport analogy, what may be proposed does not appear to be scheduled to leave in the immediate future. With no one identifiable in charge you will encounter different groups. One group is the educational passengers known as students. It is important to get feedback from them. Some may be in the departure lounge, looking out the window watching the prototypes on the tarmac. Overheard comments are an indispensable resource for guiding the coming design iterations so that as if by magic, they increasingly meet their expectations. Another group is the teachers, and their responses have been diverse. Some of their inputs are framed in terms of the current way we have been doing things. In this respect they are not unlike taxi drivers with their initial response to Uber or those in traditional print responding to Facebook. The wisdom of hindsight is that technology alone is not the last word on disruptive change. What is proposed must work and be cost effective but there is also a key behavioral dimension to consider. The customer changes to think differently, behaves in new ways and the technology is just the enabler. Initially all focus is on the gadgets and the clever advances but at the end of the day customers say I can send a parcel by Uber or update my status on Facebook. In this case it might be I can be confident explanations that I give in class will not cause scientists to roll their eyes. The teacher's practical questions reduce to three queries, is there a specific example where it does something better? Why would you want to use it? Is there going to be some hidden price catch? To pick out a key advantage gained from using this system, a student experiencing scientist in the box demonstrations will understand that the majority of chemical elements are more stable when they have an extra electron. The negative ion is more stable than the neutral atom for most elements. This property is called the atom's electron affinity. When students understand this property, they will gain a more quantum mechanical sense for the atom and the electron. The alternative school view that represents electrons as dots on the blackboard is unstable. 
It is an equivalent situation to seeing 2D cartoon pictures of tables and then going on to build them in real life with only two legs. A two-legged table is unstable. Having addressed the first gatekeeping question of if there is some standout feature that we are going to see scientist in the box delivering, we come to the second question, why would you want to use this technique? What is the core motivating difference? As a starting point we could say our response to our environment is guided by our senses and what we imagine once the stimulus is no longer in front of us. Our imagination allows us to run virtual simulations of senses and in our head rewind the tape so we take the appropriate next step. By way of explanation you could imagine the taste of a roast dinner and then imagine the steps leading up to that point and use this as a blueprint or manifest of actions required to put the roast in the baking pan and turn on the oven hours before you have arranged for your friends to arrive having earlier shared your imaginings with them. What we are saying is that we want to move beyond this starting point of just running simulations of our senses. Education extends the student's imagination via training. This is seen most clearly in written exams that stimulate the student's imagination. We assign grades for what we perceive is their understanding from reading their descriptions of what they have imagined. What we claim, as the fundamental reason for use of scientist in the box, is that it manages imagination-sensitive explanations for ideas that are intelligible but when all said and done, they are simply beyond the capability of human imagination. Such advanced ideas are the crown jewels of modern science. The scientist in the box explains, rather than obscures these treasures. Let us walk through education as it reaches its high watermark in building a student's imaginative capacity. If you imagine educators as pilots at the controls of some form of cockpit, the speed increases until there is vibration and warning lights appear. In this context we will recommend switching on expert in a box and traveling at higher speed rather than dropping back to a slower speed and never quite reaching our destination. As an example of an entry level we may consider teaching how to bake a cake, for this there are many direct sensory experiences that students mentally replay or imagine that guides their practice in the kitchen. They physically weigh the ingredients and mix them. The next level deals with things that are not imaginable but are intelligible. How about buying the ingredients with money? Money has no weight, it is abstract. It is a social construct, a collective illusion. It has consequence as you can go to jail if you steal it. It is teachable by association with things that you can imagine buying with it. So far education is doing well. In the next level we look at some of the other abstract tools used in cooking. Numbers help us to count how many eggs are required. The numbers themselves don't weigh anything, and like money they have an agreed meaning. Similar to money, they are abstract intelligible, but education has a link with what can be imagined. Endless hours are spent counting sheep, flowers and blocks. When the complexity advances to algebra we need to expand our number system to algebraic numbers. There is a special class of imaginary numbers which can give us the answer to the square root of minus one. We are not helped here by this name because real numbers can be linked to what we can imagine, whereas imaginary numbers cannot be imagined. So, if real numbers can be imagined, then non-real numbers can't be imagined. Needless to say, this is a high watermark that many teachers chuckle a bit at and then avoid. It is unfortunate then that in the 1920s it was discovered that atoms described by algebra were in fact a reality of algebraic numbers. For example, atoms of the cake have no moving parts yet are described by complex numbers that rotate with time. No part of an atom has any surfaces. Electrons fill the space of an atom like genies in a bottle. In fact, the trick is not imagining something which is fundamentally beyond human imagination. This was the key breakthrough of quantum mechanics, but unfortunately schools balked at this memo. So, in answer to the second question, you would want to use scientist in the box, so you don't inadvertently wind up unteaching quantum mechanics. The third practical question relates to cost. Although teachers tend not to comment directly, they often know of a friend who would insist on any new idea being free, and further it being effectively cheaper to run than the traditional demonstration that you would typically find in a cardboard box sitting on a shelf in a school storeroom. The first objection that comes to mind is there is no room at the inn. The existing demonstrations are taking up all the available shelf space. Perhaps therefore the market will be restricted to new schools although this is not the first time old product has built up in a system. Perhaps, like mobile phones or cars some kind of trade in arrangement might work. Then there is the observation that we haven't yet convinced some Steve Jobs or Elon Musk like celebrity figure with their associated wealth to run a high powered product launch. This is true, but it is also true the scientist in the box is not a consumer product but rather a manifestation of Arduino and Raspberry Pi hobby kits that are themselves mature platforms. After the prototypes have been tested the objective is to create a brokerage site similar to building your own computer. A single order generates multiple supplier suborders. 
these can be choreographed to arrive at a summer vacation workshop for students to build. Ironically scientist in the box may be thought of as paying some form of tribute to Jobs and Musk in that they use smartphone technology, rechargeable batteries, and have a loose semblance to driverless technology with units navigating the education system when they instruct staff to post them to the destinations they nominate on their electronic labels. Big technology does have a behind-the-scenes role to play in making this product effectively free for schools. For this story we have a fictional Aunt Martha who would love to find the ideal gift for her relative named Sam, whose birthday is coming up. Her browser profile is analyzed and suggests a scientist in the box experience package. Sam receives an introduction kit on the day and then selects from options a project that piques their attention. It is duly shipped. There is an optional discussion board with Martha that allows her to offer encouragement or for her to be kept up to date as to what is happening. At the outset, Martha's Facebook friends are messaged to see if they would like to join in and contribute to the purchase of the present. If by whatever construct Sam's school won't accept what he forward slash she has built, the scientist in the box demonstration can be shipped to another school, perhaps in another country. The transfer is arranged online with the box updating its shipping label and reporting its location via GPS. We have to pause here to note a grade of explanation transition. Up until this point the design features are fairly standard. They are only novel in the context of education. Electron Affinity EEA is well known, only it is overlooked by the current teaching framework. Questioning the Bohr classical atom is equivalent to pointing out to a flat earther, platitism, that shadows appear longer as one approaches the poles. Measuring your shadow length in Lapland, you wouldn't announce that you have discovered some kind of new phenomena. Similarly, it is far from a recent revelation that electron wave functions need complex numbers to describe them. Use of trade in systems and Arduino kits are not new. It is more a case of it hasn't been done that way before for this situation. Teaching the Bohr atom is effectively a flat earth view of the atom. Pointing out that there is some problem with processing evidence doesn't advance the situation on a social level. It is a social dilemma. It is not unlike investigating an Amish crime scene and the suspect ridiculing DNA evidence. You are not required to educate the suspect before you can lay charges. In a musical piece key change alerts the listener that a new layer of meaning or a new perspective follows. This point in this paper marks the start of novel practice. As with a musical piece the style stays the same. The scientist in the box demonstration will be shown to have features that reduce the hidden labor cost of getting the demonstration in front of the students. The act of retrieving and then returning demonstrations takes on a different character when the scale of the activity is considered. By analogy you could think of a single penguin coming ashore at Phillip Island on the south coast of Australia. It is a different thing to witness thousands of them jumping out of the surf after dusk each evening. Fortunately for the penguins they know where to go and parent and chick recognize each other's call. As a reasonable estimate each high school has to prepare 20 demonstrations a day from a store of 1000 and deliver them to the correct classroom at the correct time. Here is where the smart electronics comes into action. A key change in the tune of this explanation. All boxes have the same of 4 footprint and are a multiple of 25 millimeters high. As such they rack or stack charge. In sleep mode they periodically report their GPS and Wi-Fi strength triangulated position as well as their charge. Upon being selected they wake up and self-test. When the laboratory assistant enters the room, the assistant says, OK, collection time. At which the first box lights up with the teacher's color and beeps and if desired announces the teacher's name. The lesson particulars are printed on the electronic label that looks like a Kindle ebook. When the first one is selected and placed on a transfer trolley the second one lights up and so forth. Importantly, if in the lesson the unit is found to have a piece missing or broken then the teacher can talk into the box at the completion of the lesson to log a voice memo that then attaches an alert to the demonstration's control icon. Alternatively, if the demonstration is to be used in the next lesson at a different location it can ask to be put outside the classroom in the last 10 minutes of the lesson. Some solutions can be seen from equipment management in healthcare, where tracking and in-situ telemetry has a large impact for busy hectic hospitals and is perhaps overkill for a small country hospital. This system would have most impact for a senior STEM high school, but it may mean that smaller high schools could share resources and have a virtual collective store. The scientist in the box comes to class. The discussion thus far has been about the scientist in the box wrap around for traditional demonstrations that doesn't move them conceptually too far beyond the way things have always been done. Interfacing with the education sector is a bit like talking to a crazy relative who hasn't understood that you are no longer at school. You explain to them that you have been working with auditors on the due diligence required for investment in your company. Your relative is not interested in this but really wants to know if you are top of your primary school class, you are now well into your 20s. 
With a well-meaning smile they hand you your party hat and pull back the curtain on the party table. See all the other professionals are sitting there wearing their hats. The well-meaning relative is in their zone. The challenge is to address the social dimension of what you are doing without challenging your relative and getting into a needless debate. To focus exclusively in on the scientist in the box hardware let's call this aspect A. Does A show something novel? Does A use an approach that is currently missing in our repertoire? Is A affordable? Is A practical to use? All these have a positive answer. No red flag has been raised. We are free to continue, but the considerations have all been about A which is only the hardware aspect. What about A operated by social system B? How does this AB system work? Let us consider a few artifact social situation systems. There is the holy relic and a gathering of pilgrims. There is a crown and loyal subjects. There is a gavel and a courtroom brought to order. There is the Melbourne Cup and the winning jockey holding it aloft. There is an upturned top hat and an expectant audience at a magic show. All these signify power, show who has the power, and have deep social cooperation and timing programmed in order for them to play out the scene we imagine for them. If at an archaeological dig you were to uncover a holy relic, a crown, a gavel, a Melbourne cup, and a magician's top hat you would be best off taking your finds to a second-hand shop rather than a museum. Museums work on the artifact social system narrative, one that their patrons deem to be serious. If we consider the reader's mind an archaeological site, we have unearthed the traditional and scientist-in-the-box demonstrations. We have a fair idea of how the traditional method plays out as we have all seen it. What variation of the social system is imagined for the scientist-in-the-box? The first observation is that your modern student audience can swipe between social frameworks for entertainment. Whether it is an out-of-control cockpit, a penguin invasion or an archaeological dig they can pick up on information very quickly from chaos that can easily leave the older folk bewildered. The second observation is that the timing and controls so critical for artifacts to work in a prescribed system need to be more flexible once we loosen the constraints. The third observation is that computer gaming has changed the participation dynamic. The demonstration is seen in a game environment with levels and insights held in software for which the gamer develops an understanding. In deference to the description of computer games we will sketch out some game play. When the teacher orders the demonstration from a drop-down list of suggested items a red alert dot appears on the science learning icons on the students' phones and computers. They can now choose and complete a number of customized podcast tutorials that have been generated specially for them. These are read from a base text document by Natural Machine Speech. Google Wavenet offers cloud-based conversion using code that has been generated by machine learning algorithms. It is noticeably closer to natural speech and less work to understand. Perhaps we are evolving to listen to personal assistance. The student can select the pitch, gender and accent that they find to be the most effective. They can set the pace to speed up if they are to hear the material for a second time or slow down if they have to listen for key pieces of information. This is audio rendering of a text document by a Wavenet plugin. The rendering engine composes this audio by synthesizing it from a selection of sections contained within a source text document. There are sections, introduction, concept explanation 1, question 1, correct answer 1, incorrect answer 1.1, 1.2 and 1.3, concept explanation 2 and so forth. This is then diced, multiple choice options randomized and then spliced to produce a selection of podcast styles, introduction, lesson, general quiz, in which the correct answer is given directly after the response, adaptive quiz, and class quiz. For a class quiz the response papers can be collected and scanned or alternatively answers given at the end of the test for more immediate feedback. There is the capacity for scientist, teacher and student reflections to modify the core text as well as review long-term performance to diagnose and fine-tune the podcasts. Again, we are at a threshold of having contemporary ideas that simply have been missed and now transitioning them into being generally accepted. The education system has come to the position of not teaching electron affinity. In the circumstances it is not novel to include what has been overlooked. Having demonstrations identify themselves in a storeroom and potentially be directing themselves to repair is novel. Getting text to be managed by software and having it audio rendered is enterprising but not novel in the field of computer games. Using phone keypads or voice recognition is also standard practice. Shaking the phone a set number of times to indicate an answer may be an interesting variation. The potential for these podcasts to be listened to while on public transport to and from school, and to be integrated with computer consoles on exercise gym treadmills for mixed cognitive and physical training is an important possible extension. It will most likely have a limited benefit for a selection of students for a limited time. Nonetheless it is a benefit. The classroom interaction will be a major development. 
Using the data collected from interactive podcasts, the demonstration will have the ability to address students by their preferred names and shape the demonstration to their strengths and weaknesses. Realization in three prototypes. Why would you use a prototype? A prototype is an early sample, model, or release of a product built to test a concept or process. It is a term used in a variety of contexts, including semantics, design, electronics, and software programming. A prototype is generally used to evaluate a new design, and to enhance precision by system analysis and by collecting responses from users. What this doesn't say but assumes is there is not already an existing commonly available form of the idea out there. You wouldn't say look at my prototype coffee cup it holds hot coffee. But why use three prototypes? Further is it wise to give an answer to this question using a military metaphor when speaking to a sensitized education audience? Mechanized armor involves the idea of a coordinated strategy to take control of battlefield dynamics. Here we are looking to do the same with the education dynamics. The armor analogy also captures the idea of the sudden transformation of people's thinking once it was realized that operations could be better managed with radio communication in every vehicle. In this case, scientists in the box GPS and WIF capabilities are included for a nominal increase in cost. Armor also has well-established management of fuel, rechargeable power banks, battle readiness, self-test, and repair in the field, e-paper labels to return units for repair. Armor is a good analogy in that it is clear to see that it is unwise to bundle all roles into one form of vehicle. A troop carrier tank self-propelled gun would struggle to optimize any particular role. It is better to have specialist vehicles. Not all readers would be familiar with armor operation, but for those that are, the following description of armor is a useful scaffold with which to understand the prototype strategy. The troop carrier carries the troops to the operation area, primary school prototype. The infantry debas all get out to operate with tanks, secondary school science utility prototype. Having taken strategic ground, they enable self-propelled guns to engage at long range, university specialist prototype. What the analogy with mechanized strategy is particularly useful for is setting out the requirements to deploy capabilities then to figure out how to exercise them. At another level it captures the idea of moving people through a succession of scenarios to get boots on the ground at the objective. Prototype 1, Primary School Science If you were to ask a primary school student about this demonstration the first piece of information they would offer is that it is all about Gladys the little yellow rubber duck that loves to dance. When the box is plugged in the blue dance floor glows and when you touch the area of the box with a foil patch underneath it Doctor Who music plays which Gladys the duck evidently hears and waddle dances to. Further inquiry will reveal smooth transitioning from play to a more formal understanding as it is explained how Gladys got her magnet inside her. Gladys's transparent egg reveals it also has a magnet inside. It sits in a nest to the side of the large solenoid electromagnet duck pond. When placed in the pond it also joins in the reverie. Educators can see play and formal levels of interaction proceeding hand in hand. They inquire if a student knows that the current in the wire suddenly reverses with each note. The student response is worth contemplating. The music should be sung as quacks. We are endeavoring to engineer this feature. The student has many years education ahead of them and now that they have a familiarity with the demonstration it then becomes a resource that they can revisit and wrap with further layers of insight. What educators found surprising was that there were key concepts they were confident that they, as teachers, had mastered, but later found that there was more to learn. The mapping of the solenoid's magnetic field can be done with a gimbaled inclination compass. This device has two angular degrees of freedom and shows two angular dimensions of magnetic field direction, the azimuth or inclination to the horizon and somewhat confusingly named compass direction. Using the inclination compass just free in the classroom shows the Earth's magnetic field inclination falls below the horizon by 64 degrees for Sydney, Australia. If you were to conduct the experiment in a Colombo classroom in Sri Lanka you would measure near zero degrees. Your local inclination can be found from wwwmagnetic Declination refers to the angle between rotational or true north and compass north. The town of Apathium in Thailand has small magnetic inclination and declination. The latter is due in a large part because the town, rotational and magnetic poles can be found on a great circle. Of note there is a difference between gravitational plumb bob down and rotational down. 
For Greenwich this is about 1, 1, 0, 0, 0 of a degree meaning the Greenwich meridian is marked in arrow closer to Australia by 102 metres, 5 cricket pitches. The strength of the magnetic field at different points in the solenoid can be measured by a solid-state magnetic field probe. The non-technical name for this is a field strength chip. It is important to note that the solid-state physics that is behind how the chip detects magnetic fields is built on quantum physics that is not accessible through the non-quantum treatment of science currently found in schools. If you do measure the field strength with a field strength probe you will find that the maximum is in the center of the coil midway down. The strength is reasonably uniform across this region because of the large diameter and reasonable height of the coil. Most educators, having not had previous access to a large solenoid are surprised to find that there is little or no force on a magnet held near the center of the solenoid while the force is noticeably stronger near the coiled wire circumference. This is because what they are holding is a magnetic dipole, north-south, and the force on this is proportional not to the field strength, but to the field gradient. This topic is littered with misconceptions and errors. Monopoles, current carrying wires cutting field lines, and even magnetic pressure exerted by a bunching of field lines are just a few of the popular misconceptions that create a legacy of hazy science that we gift our students. But is it all that important to know that it is the magnetic field gradients that exert forces on magnets? It is if you wish to understand quantum physics. In 1922 when Otto Stern and Walther Jelak fired a beam of electrons into a steep magnetic field gradient the beam split into two streams. Electrons had charge, but they discovered they were also tiny magnets. There was nothing mechanical holding them in a certain orientation, but they were not free to spin and point north like a compass. They were stuck either pointing along the field line drifting north or against it drifting south. Welcome to quantum physics. Let us propose that we design a mock-up of the stern Jellac demonstration with materials we could source from a hardware shop. We could order neodymium supermagnet spheres and use compressed air to fire a stream of them fed by a screw mechanism into a barrel. We could have a powerful system of electromagnets that switches the field with every ball fired so that it streams out north, south, north, south. Would this mean we could get the stern Jellac experiment splitting the electrons into two beams when fired through the edge of our solenoid where there is greatest gradient and force on the magnet dipole? What would happen is the aligned magnets would be deflected up and the misaligned magnets would begin to rotate, they would be deflected down but not to the same extent. If such a demonstration were built, we would diplomatically commend the intention of communication but point out that it critically misrepresents the electron to the extent that it unteaches quantum mechanics. Firstly, electrons have no surfaces. There would be an equation for one if anyone thought they had them. Secondly it does not have the symmetry of a ball bearing ZU3 rather it has ZU2 symmetry this means it has to rotate 720 degrees rather than 360 degrees in order to look the same. It can't flip or spin as it has no parts that would show this was happening, analogous to a chalk mark on a tire. It doesn't have a smaller bit to place a mark on. It travels around as if it has a flywheel inside, but it has no parts and is not spinning. This has been described as spinning in a hidden dimension we cannot imagine. We call it a fundamental property meaning nothing is causing it. The closest physical model you might handle that shows some of its character is a Mobius strip that has 723 symmetry. A little less close is a pretzel that has a central clockwise or anticlockwise twist of the dough. The model that gives the most accurate idea of being able to change orientation but without the pearl passing through the equator is a sock. You can hang it toe down. Reach inside and pull it inside out so the toe points up. A clockwise arrow on the inside can change to an anticlockwise arrow on the outside. The sock not actually spinning is a more accurate representation. Further detail can be added by having the small sock with a magnet in the toe hit small bells at either end of its travel. The sound wave radiating out on each spin flip represents the light photon emitted. It is not visible light but long wavelength radio and microwaves. You cannot see the light signals, but in the model you can hear the signal. The importance of turning anything into a miniature mobile phone in a magnetic field will not be lost on the students. Mobile phones work through walls. In a school, students could like or dislike lessons, and their votes could be combined with their phone location to generate a 3D map revealing where the coolest or the least inspiring teaching is going on. While this situation is fictional, it fairly describes how MRI machines detect stroke areas of the brain by getting the brain to produce spin-flip radio waves that travel through the walls of the brain, the skull. As a brief note MRI use the magnetic effects not of electrons but protons, but the SU2 symmetry and spin-flips but not in a way anyone is capable of imagining still holds true. So, after Gladys, inclination probes, intensity probes, dipole probes we are constructing a magnetic sock to faithfully represent the quantum electron. And there is more that can be done.
An induction probe coil can show flashes on LEDs when the field suddenly changes. Faraday's law of induction means that a loop of conducting wire will be effectively a battery with a voltage generated proportional to the rate of change of magnetic field, the area of the loop, and the number of coils. Put this up to a light bulb, and this will blink on the field changes of the duck pond. It will flash with each note. This links to transcranial electromagnetic convulsion brain therapy that is dramatically shown when a coil of roughly the same diameter and current wave form that Gladys experiences is placed on a patient's head. It could notionally get the hapless patient to dance if not jerkily to Doctor Who. On each note the current reverses inducing neural activity in the brain which is seen as a limb or facial convulsion. So, what do you think of Gladys? What level of depth and complexity do you stop and say, Gladys that is enough? Is induction too much to teach? Maybe there is some line where you could mention induction cooktops and wireless charging but avoid mentioning putting the induction coil on your head and causing convulsions. Does a scientist's assessment of a teacher's ability to answer these questions really matter? You might think of a scientist in the same light as a bank manager who is assessing someone's suitability for a loan. The bank manager in your opinion is going into too much detail and appears to be overly concerned about a bit of social gambling. The manager's concern about gambling is not moral. It is more about understanding the thinking of the client. Social gambling looks like earning income, the activity pulling the lever on a one-arm bandit takes effort but it's not productive work that fits well with the narrative of repaying the loan. Teaching that induction can be understood because this is the equation takes effort but it is not understanding. Saying that a famous person discovered it and ever since students have been getting the right answer if they used it, the wrong one if they didn't. This is the best you can do with school book empty space which has its origins in Middle Ages theology of angels and side steps the physical properties of nothingness. There is electric and magnetic springiness of space that allows it to transmit light, angular momentum, and store energy. Insight into this is where Gladys and the scientist in the box are going. Prototype 2, Secondary School Science It is a complex process to inspect a prototype on the laboratory benchtop and visualize how it will function with trained users and support infrastructure. What follows is a description with some of the functionality and modes of use sketched in. If you were to ask a secondary school student about this demonstration the first piece of information they would offer is that the scientist in a box works like Batman's utility belt only it is not a belt but a box complete with retro telephone handset and that you are able to borrow the utility box from most libraries like a book. Advice that you could well give the student is that any reference to pop culture in a formal setting such as an exam is probably not the best strategy. Examiners are likely to misunderstand. The student could show on their phone a video compilation of the Caped Crusaders resolving problem after problem with a surprising variety of gadgets they pull out of the utility belt. The prototype utility box has five solid state and five thermocouple temperature sensors, a pH sensor, two gas pressure sensors, three weight scales that combine to monitor the mass of a beaker whilst on a tripod, two motorized precision liquid delivery syringes and more. The sensors were selected because of economic and technical considerations. At an indicative cost of $5 each there is significant discounts when ordered in multiples. As one is able to reconstruct the many gadgets that are found in Batman's utility belt by watching through the TV episodes and noting them down with a pencil and paper, we did a similar thing for the utility box. Instead we went through the syllabus and many textbooks, reading through experiments and expanding the list of sensors that would handle each one. A combination solution of the utility box with accessible sensors and the Texas Instruments sensor tile covers nearly all experiments we have reviewed so far. The sensor tile is essentially a miniaturized utility box with the sensors embedded on the chip. Two would be inside the utility box, able to be taken out and placed in dynamics trolleys and the like. From a student perspective the tiles look like wireless sensors of the box, itself battery powered and wireless. The solid state temperature sensors have power and common signal wires. They report their temperature and laser written chip serial number so after you have set up the first one there is no additional overhead in adding more. Temperature data streams down the signal line tagged with a chip identifier. Thermocouples have a greater temperature range and a fast fraction of a second response time. Different types of sensors each have their strong points to recommend them. Hence the selection of a combination of sensors, solid state and thermocouple. The solid state compares temperature dependent transistor performance in the chip, whilst the thermal couple can be understood through quantum mechanics and can be thought of as a battery for which the tiny voltage can be measured. A thermocouple is in fact two batteries with different alloys and temperature performance. We get to measure and compare the pearl end back in the box whilst the probe end is just shorted together. 
This means several things, two wires shorted together as a sensor is quite a simple and robust device and there is a high temperature variety that can be plunged into a Bunsen flame revealing the flame's structure. It also means that thermocouples actually only measure temperature differences. This means that you need one of the solid state sensors telling you the temperature inside the box. Finally, you can increase the sensitivity by connecting thermocouples in series. Our tests find that about a group of 8 thermocouples is about optimum enabling you to see 0.05 C increases in temperature when table salt is added to a beaker or if it is heated by stirring. Multi-thermocouples have the drawback of expense and the bundle of wires is more cumbersome. The increased sensitivity and number of probes leads to a clearer view. The situation could be likened to comparing the underwater view with the water in direct contact with your eyes and the sharper images seen when you have goggles. When heating a beaker of water probes on the tripod, flame, bottom, top and above the beaker give a clearer finer grained view of what is going on. Having redundant sensors, say on each tripod leg and sensors always running allows the story to be unpacked. At 220 seconds the flame was lit, the legs heated up slightly differently as the flame was not centered. Having different types of sensors running would show further aspects. The mass held in the beaker drops as the water evaporates. With appropriate fixtures the pressure of the steam could be measured. The temperature dependence of the pH of aspirin would be an interesting study. The addition of automated syringes allows the acid-base titration curve to be explored. If you neutralize trivalent phosphoric acid the graph of pH against volume of base added, the curve flattens multiple times showing a pH buffering effect. The traditional configuration of sensors is very much in the mind of traditional teachers. Connection of the power to each sensor and the wiring and management to get the readings out seem at first glance to mean a spaghetti of wires shrouding any experiment. Each sensor means more time more to manage and more risk meaning the odds of a single experiment working in the room wanes. At some point between 1 and 15 experiments per class we cross over to the impossible. There are at maximum 4 wall power outlets per experimental setup. For this not to be the case there must be some key differences. Plugging into the wall. The sensors are battery powered. An array of meter boxes for each sensor. All sensors source to the one utility box, all data is streamed to a website. Fault correction for broken sensors, or poorly positioned sensors. Sensors self-test, then are on continuously streaming data once the lid is opened. Students are able to text and voice message their data, that places annotated speech bubbles on the data. One can imagine problems that would crop up if you suddenly gave traditionally schooled students a complex task and a complex instrument. This is not the thesis of this paper. Notionally students would have been exposed to the primary school version of this box and learned to explore and test the functionality. Some students would have had the opportunity to familiarize themselves with the unit when an older sibling brought it home for an experiment. The key enabler in boosting student confidence is the use of the unit in automated external defibrillator mode. Here students are coached by the unit step by step. This provides for venues and modes that vary from the traditional home schooling, lunch, before or after school or as independent activities. Another aspiration is that it is a globally developed platform. Different components, the teaching script for automated podcasts, the lesson instruction, the topics for investigation are all open source. All have to the potential to fall from popularity if they lack merit of if they do to gain in popularity and to be refined. It is also possible to reframe experimental science starting a few steps from the formulation of the English experimentalists with the idea confining experiments to supporting or refuting a hypothesis. This activity sees the role of experiments as a thought quality control procedure. Instead taking a broader approach we could say that scientific measurement is an undertaking directed towards guiding human endeavor. I measure the temperature of boiling water in an endeavor to become more knowledgeable about nature. I read the power meter for an electricity company in an endeavor to charge customers. This is less cumbersome than shoehorning every situation into a hypothesis and a clumsy exercise in inductive logic. Prototype 3, University Level Demonstration This third prototype occupies a conceptual space to some extent framed by the scope and design of its two predecessors. It is natural to first address the physical attributes, however its psychological presence looms high in the minds of two key stakeholders, the teachers and the students. From the teacher's perspective there is an overwhelming sense of being hacked. You can almost hear in some ivory tower somewhere. We've been hacked. What vulnerability have they exploited? Apparently we haven't actually understood basic science and have been intellectually shortchanging the children. How bad can it get? It is almost as if after watching us do exactly the same thing for over 100 years, they know our very next move. 
They are using pop culture and fake news to invent fictional characters to override our control of communication. From the student's perspective there will be naturally a pop culture overlay. Leading up to this there has been Gladys the Duck and the Utility Box. The Einstein der Haas pendulum surely has a pop culture alias to bookmark this concept for later reference as the dynamics of the universe in which it exists is constructed. Here the term universe is used in a popular culture context like Pokemon, DC, and Marvel universes. Part of the unwritten grammar of pop culture is that key gadgets and characters have their features, but importantly these features play a defining role in the unfolding narrative. Gladys might be seen as a member of a subversive cadre of ducks. Students will know got any grapes. Batman's utility belt is not just about gadgets. It is about the creative contract between the series writers and audience that says note this now as it will play a key role in a coming plot twist. On a practical level this means reverse engineering a science lesson to create a crisis. This involves a clinical assessment of something obvious, profound and outside the net of concepts currently in play. It was not off the shelf but required months of garage development. An amateur setting, but under the surface professional processes. And lo, a quantum pendulum, now off the shelf. The crisis unfolds at the end of semester when the science teacher fields these questions, would an object made of ceramic so it couldn't conduct, rock about the axis of a magnetic field passing through it, can a light beam carry a twisting force in it, what do you think of those people who say we live in a double image of two universes but you have to know where to look to see the evidence of this. On hearing these questions, our notional teacher could have a number of responses, each of which would lead the students in different directions. We have tried to capture as many variations as possible. All permutations have to respond to the situation after the holidays when the student walks into the class with an Einstein de Haas pendulum they have ordered online and then assembled. Is this not a ceramic rocking about a magnetic field line, do things not rock when they emit or absorb light, and this rock resides in empty space the light travels through, does the fact exact copies of matter, save for their spin, sit through each other in space imply we are living in a double image universe, and one more question what system of thinking are you basing what you are teaching us? This is a constructed and contrived situation, but rather arising from chance the existing scope of teaching was considered and what might have been a nightmare scenario provided research objectives. Was it possible to systematically resolve technical issues so to place a demonstration of quantum mechanics in the hands of students? One that sounds the alarm on the half mock science taught. A condensed account of those issues will be given as they are the key that was found that unlocks this demonstration that then unlocks the intellectual future of students. But first we need to sketch our path through pop culture, so when we have got the system ready, we have a committed audience. The quantum pendulum, one that comes from the hands of Einstein, and his trusty Dutch off-sided duh, as has the comic book mystique of say Captain America, and his World War II call to action. It has elements of being a key gadget like the flux capacitor of Back to the Future. Indeed, the magnetic field flux reverses. While the proton torpedoes of Star Wars, while beyond the scrutiny of Earth-bound scientists by being in the galaxy far far away are just as problematic as most concept structures, they are a gadget highly valued by the rebels and empire alike. Luke fires them to destroy the Death Star. There is formidable opposition. Luke has to fly into the heart of the Death Star with his gadget. He has the force, but not let's forget the relationship with his droid, R2-D2. Being aware of the sense of drama, it should be owned that the laboratory in which the quantum pendulum was built was no stage set, much closer to the downed pilot carrying out repairs with screwdrivers and something hard to identify but obviously electronic. Not working. Why is that? The pendulum designed to spin also bounces and sways. Thought bubble, I must control this pendulum, the future of all students depends on it. Cut to some image of a child playing with a two-string color wheel. Ah, fix the pendulum top and bottom, make the wire light, taut but bringing the weight into a home position. Time passes as calendar dates fall revealing two months pass as concept prototype gives way to research prototype and finally production prototype where the dials are turned up to danger and the apparatus blows up. Finally, I have it. In 1917 Einstein and Duh has used iron and an oscillation period of 10 seconds. A combination of using ferrite a magnetic ceramic type used discovered in 1950 and the double torsion suspension increased the oscillation rate 300 fold, miniaturized it and exploited solid state electronics to provide timing control to one millionth of a second. This was all routinely developed through the prototyping process. Each time the field is reversed down the axis of the support wire and ferrite cylinder the electrons flip their spin and give the pendulum a kick. The process is similar to swinging to higher heights on a children's playground swing, where are your legs providing the push rather than in the case of the ferrite the electrons give an angular kick. As with a playground swing, your eventual height or angle you swing through is governed by the frictional loss of the hinge couplings. 
For the model these have been designed by selection of material of the wire and the attachment to be low loss. This means a small push can lead to a large angle swing, but this means it has to tune to a narrow frequency range. The swing is shown by a laser that hits a mirror on the pendulum and exits the clear roof to the box. The frequency is displayed and sweeps through resonance, growing to a maximum and then reducing. This development was felt to enable student to test and take control. Conclusion The educational system is stuck using out-of-date material is hardly news. You know what they are doing. They might perceive some remote aspired and without wanting to appear being rude would prefer not to be disturbed. This lack of response sets up the problem, if we are going to find a way forward, it's not going to be with these guys. Science had to help out, we had to build demonstrations of the very science that was being brushed aside. Electronics had to help out, if teachers were not going to step up to the plate, we had to get students to build their own social robots that could. Popular culture had to help out, if moving the students to the culture was too hard, we had to look at a culture that would be acceptable to the students. The science we understood, the electronics we had to learn, while the pop culture aspect was a perspective that was introduced by the testers so would be remiss of us not to mention. Further we picked up on conjectures that gave a perspective on what people had observed. The first conjecture is that the Bohr atom phenomenon was a pop culture universe that had gone mainstream. It is a two-dimensional cartoon drawing which has unphysical properties laid out in the Bohr postulates but nonetheless break laws of physics like the best of the fantastic fictional truths of other pop universes. Purist would object and see this caricature as cherry picking, he was funded by a beer company that pumped free beer into his home when he won the Nobel Prize. He and his staff at some time carried toy cap guns to have shootouts, part of an experiment. He was certainly colorful and his story is intriguing. He also burdened us with a liquid drop nucleus, which is really the universal picture we have of the nucleus as a cluster of spherical neutrons and protons. Unfortunately, it too has no connection with reality only as a graphic comic shorthand. Understanding the broad thrust of the first conjecture is important for understanding further speculation derived from this. The willingness to believe in the poor atom and general evasive behavior when questioning the practice of teaching it is seen as being no different from a hardcore, fanatical fan of a pop culture. This is hard to prove, it is true the system of knowledge is based on unphysical articles of faith or postulates. The next development from this is that the belief structure is associated with some narrowing of thoughts. Obviously not opening up explanations to critical analysis or exploring how quantum mechanics would account for some phenomena is effectively some degree of narrowing. Also, the idea that all experimental measurements are done with a hypothesis in mind is a narrow perspective leaving students in some difficulty cleanly explaining the use of scientific equipment just to detect things that you are less able to do with your senses alone. Given this is it not possible that there may be a too narrow understanding of conclusion? The idea of disproving a hypothesis, although, a much quoted idea is narrow. The idea of a judge's conclusion, deeming the significance of evidence, and determining a consequence is what many expect from conclusions. In this case we are urged to get our evidence before decision makers in the education department and argue our case in a hearing. A scientific conclusion best portrayed as a disinterested situation assessment that would fully inform other scientists so that they might take the work further. As such it is a matrix of evidence and plausible conclusions. It is open-ended in that you are invited to find more evidence or alternate conclusions that would advance the field. Communication is skewed to support this process, often at the expense of a general interest readership. The conclusion that is appropriate here is a strategic one. It frames the scenario, nominates behaviors and motivations, and proposes a course of action. Teachers of old didn't know how to teach quantum mechanics and pressed in a ball pop science substitute instead. We have developed systems that not only show but explain quantum mechanics. Crowd-sourced demonstrations, open-source software development, new and marginal markets will provide the conditions for early adopters to introduce these innovations. Then they might take hold.